Welcome to Defeat Your Cravings, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston, Ph.D. Dr. Glenn is a clinical psychologist and former multi-million dollar consultant to the big food industry and uses his experience to help you defeat your cravings. This show will help you to focus on dramatically reducing cravings and leaving the diet mentality behind so you can more easily and effortlessly achieve your health, fitness, and body composition goals. Please remember, no doctor-patient relationship is created via this show, and you are responsible for confirming any changes to your diet, health, or psychological routines with an appropriately licensed professional before implementing them. Before we get started, if you haven't downloaded the free smartphone app to access dozens of these recordings all in one place, as well as to avail yourself of a confidential community for support, motivation, and assistance, please visit the podcast link on DefeatYourCravings.com as soon as possible. And now, here's your host, Dr. Glenn Livingston. Hey, it's the very good Dr. Glenn Livingston with DefeatYourCravings.com. I'm here with John Chancellor from Teach the Soul teachthesoul.com. And you might have heard John before. John is a longtime friend and colleague and mentor and someone that I turn to for advice when I'm confused or need perspective. He's been reading for, how long have you been reading for now, John? Is it 80 years yet? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think you've literally been reading for 80 years. You don't sound like you're as old as you are, but you literally have a lifetime of knowledge and wisdom behind you. And John is in the midst of putting together a book. What are you calling the book now? Is it Words to Live and Work By? Words to Live and Work By, yes. He's really exploring the meaning and practical applications of famous quotes. John, would you like to talk a little bit about the book and then we could talk about some of the quotes the reason I wanted to have John on is I want to talk about how you can use it to defeat your cravings and eat according to the food plan of your desire. But John, tell me a little bit about how this book came together, and then we'll talk about the first quote. Well, there are two parts to the book. One is, as a child, I grew up hearing my mother use, don't cry over spilt milk, don't count your chickens before they're hatched, those sort of old sayings. And they were just drummed into my head. And at some point, then, of course, in English in high school, we got to memorize quotations, to be or not to be, um, arose by any other name. I've just had a fascination with quotes because they say so much, so succinctly, in so few words. The trouble with that, that's a benefit, but it's also a problem. The problem because the quote is so short and succinct that we don't have any story around it. We don't have any context. We often don't think of the various ways it can apply. I guess about 15 years ago, I started writing short essays and called them Lessons in Life. And they featured a quote at the beginning and the end of the essay at the time, it was primarily a way to keep my name out in front of people. But there was a secondary benefit that I didn't realize was going to happen. The secondary benefit was that it actually made me a better person. That is to say that I was able to internalize the thoughts and ideas deeper and kind of adapt them as my own. So I would accept the truth of the essays I was writing and try to live up to them. Benjamin Franklin did a famous experiment with himself. He said there were 13 virtues, and so that's a quarter of the year. And he would try each week to live up to one of the virtues. He eventually gave it up, realized that nobody can possibly do that. So when I say I try to live up to um, the ideas I'm doing what Ben Franklin did. I try to do it, but realize that we never can achieve ideal behavior. In what ways did it change you, though? <laughs> well, the first and most obvious way was it reduced my anger. Um, I could get angry at the drop of a hat. If somebody cut me off in traffic, I would salute them in the good old-fashioned way. Yeah. And uh, I would never think that about you. I would never think that about you. Well, I don't do it anymore. My wife and my daughter say, wow, when somebody drives poorly, makes a bad decision, 
I don't blow the horn at them. I don't get anxious at them. I realize that they probably didn't do it intentionally. And if they did, well, that's okay too. That's who they are. So reducing the stress in my life, I don't think I have an essay about it, but one of the things I really like is remind myself when something comes up that's unpleasant, asking myself, is that a hill worth dying on? That is, how important is the situation? Oftentimes things can happen. Somebody um, butts in line uh, in front of us at the grocery store or the deli or whatever. Is this a hill worth dying on? Is it worth making a fuss over? Generally, and I would I'd say generally about 99, 95% of the time, the answer is no, this is really not worth making a fuss over. This is not worth ruining my day, getting anxious, raising my um, blood pressure. Some things are not worth defending. It's a hill not worth dying on. You could apply that to when you're craving something that's off your plan. You certainly could. That's a question that I ask myself from time to time if I'm tempted by eating something is, why do I want this? What am I trying to satisfy, trying to prove? What's my goal? What good will this do for me? Asking myself questions about why that I intend to do things is certainly one of the things that have come out of it. And if you want to go a little deeper, that's saying being a lot more proactive about things in my life instead of reactive. If you want to encompass it all, what has taught me is, is to be a lot more proactive to think about what is serving me well instead of just reacting in, in a knee-jerk reaction way that so many of us live our lives. Pry apart the space between stimulus and response and make a choice that's going to make tomorrow better than today. Absolutely. My version of, is this a hill worth dying on when it comes to food is, what kind of day do I want to have? I know that if there are particular rules I've set up that if I break them, I'm not going to have a good day. I'm going to feel disgusting and overfull and spend a good part of the rest of the day kind of sweating and feeling bloated, not able to produce what I want to produce or be as present with people as I want to be. What kind of day do I want to have? Is this a hill worth dying on? There's an interesting thought that came up as you were talking about what kind of day um, am I going to have. One of the concepts that I've learned and embraced is that for everything you do, there's a cost and a benefit. When I say cost, I'm not talking about money, but there's a cost and a benefit. A textbook example is the hot fudge sundae or the big piece of chocolate cake. There's a benefit. The benefit is uh, instant gratification. It makes you feel good. It tastes good. Um, you feel like you're treating yourself. The big thing you have to take into account with the cost benefit is the timing difference. Generally, there is a short-term cost or benefit and a long-term cost or benefit. With the hot foot sundae, the chocolate cake, the benefit is short-term. The cost is long-term. The damage you do to your body, the extra weight, the hardening of the arteries, um, that's a long-term cost. Generally in life, humans are predisposed to go for the short-term benefit because the early humans, they didn't live as long. If they didn't survive today, um, next year didn't matter. So we were predisposed to focus on the short-term benefit. In today's society, we still act or react that way, but the healthier, wiser choice is to focus on the short-term cost and long-term benefit. Education is the poster child for that. Education takes your time, energy, money immediately, and the benefits off in the future. But the more educated you are, the better educated you are. And I'm not necessarily talking about formal. The best education you can get is educating yourself. May I say a couple of things sure. about short-term versus long-term course? I, I think that's critical. And in the early days of my recovery, I call my inner food monster my inner pig. I would tell my inner pig that, yes, this would be extraordinarily pleasurable if I had it right now, because for a while... You know, I would really fall for the, but it's going to taste so good. Look at everything you're going to be giving up if you don't have that. And I would tell my inner pig, well, look, it would taste good. It would be extraordinarily pleasurable, but I'm capable of foregoing certain pleasures now in order to pursue other more significant pleasures later on. And 
you know, the more significant pleasures would be things like feeling free of concern about cardiovascular risks or diabetes or cancer, and feeling like a tall, thin man that could walk as a leader in the world and resonate a smiling presence and not having to recover from a meal and living in the body that I wanted to live in and feeling confident that I could be with a woman. That There were all these long-term pleasures that I would be going for. I recovered largely by that type of an analysis and refocusing my pig and everything I'd be giving up in the long term if I didn't give up the short-term pleasure. As I worked with almost 2,000 people over the years, it became clear to me that people have varying abilities to do that, depending upon how they were raised and how significant the addictive food patterns are. Sometimes people really need to focus on what they're going to give up in the very short term if they break the rules. Let me give you an example. I'll show you what I mean. You know, I have a rule that I don't eat chocolate. I started out, I would not have chocolate during the week. And then eventually I just felt like it would be better if I didn't have chocolate. I became someone who didn't have chocolate. Now, if I were to have a bite of chocolate, first of all, it would taste orgasmically pleasurable. Having not had it in so long, it would blow my mind because my taste buds and my pleasure systems have upregulated in sensitivity because I don't eat those concentrated types of sugars anymore and and the theobramine and you know everything else that is involved in a chocolate bar. It would be. I can acknowledge that it would be immensely pleasurable. And I can fight it by saying I'm going to be giving up all those things in the long run. But in the short run, there's a lot that I'd be giving up as well. I'd be giving up a good night's sleep tonight. I would be giving up the knowledge that I was really in control of my food. I would have let my inner pig convince me to break a rule that I previously committed to when I was of sound mind and body and had the fortitude to put it down on paper and think through what would really be best for me. I would be making myself, at least in part, a slave to whim and impulse and emotion with regards to food as compared to feeling like the master of my own destiny. And as a consequence, I'd start to think, well, how much can I get away with? How am I going to make up for it? Where do I hide the evidence? That's when I was married, if I didn't want my wife to know. And how am I going to stop? And suddenly, the freedom of mind and the ability to concentrate and be present, suddenly I'm thinking about when do I get more chocolate and how much more can I get away with? And so I've given up my peace of mind immediately, not two years from now feeling healthier and better able to ward off diabetes and heart attacks, but immediately I've given up my peace of mind. And I found that for me and really for a lot of the people that I work with, sometimes you got to fight fire with fire, which is another quotation, right? <laughs> but sometimes even though the long-term benefits of complying with your plan usually far outweigh the short term, you're going to get a sugar rush for 18 minutes and then you're going to start feeling the crash and feel depressed. You know, the long-term benefits far outweigh it. Sometimes they need that focus on what the short-term pain is going to be also which is something that I didn't really understand 20 years ago when I put this together. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. And that's an interesting way of thinking about it that I had not thought about. Very interesting. And that brings us to the end of today's broadcast of Defeat Your Cravings, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston. If you'd like to find out more about the products and services Dr. Glenn offers to help you dramatically reduce your cravings and stop overeating in 90 days or less, please visit DefeatYourCravingsCoaching.com. That's DefeatYourCravingsCoaching.com. Thanks.